Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Dr. Karen Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Of all the hot topics out there that get women talking, one of the diciest is the biological clock. And I found this out firsthand recently when I started a series of Instagram posts on the topic of the biological clock throughout the lifespan. Collaborating with me were two other therapists, Bruni Getchell and Allison Sepinara. We were astounded by the responses we got. We knew it was a hot topic. We knew that we heard a lot from our followers and from our clients. We knew that it was something that really struck a chord or hit a nerve with most of us at some point in our lives. And because you guys had so much to say about it, we decided it was a subject that needed its own podcast episode. So that's what we're doing today. This quarter, Love and Life lends a hand to 11th Candle Company. All proceeds from the sale of my book, Single is the New Black, Don't Wear White Till It's Right, will go to 11th Candle Company's Legacy Foundation. To hear more about the incredible work Amber Runyon is doing to help women escape sex trafficking, please take a listen to my podcast interview with her. It's episode 42, How Does a Candle Company Combat Human Trafficking? 11th Candle Company. Check them out at 11thcandleco.com and be sure to use promo code TAKECHARGE to receive 20% off your entire purchase. So, of course, we'll start with a little research. And as I was looking through some of the studies on the biological clock, one of the things that typically we think of the biological clock as it relates to women's fertility. That's kind of the traditional notion that we go with when someone brings up the term. Although, as we looked at in the series, the biological clock actually affects us throughout the lifespan. But one thing we should clear up is that fertility, there's a lot of misconception about, no pun intended, (laughs) about women's fertility. And according to psychology professor Jean Twenge of San Diego State University, much of the common understanding of women's fertility was derived from studies from French birth records collected from 1670 to 1830 which makes absolutely no sense when we take into consideration modern health and modern medical procedures and things like folic acid and fertility treatments. Another encouraging study by David Dunson, who is a biostatistician at Duke University, found that really a woman's fertility does, of course, decline with age, but it's much less than the common belief. For example, Dunson found that for a woman who's between the ages of 35 to 39, her fertility two days pre-ovulation is equal to that of a 19 to 26-year-old's fertility three days before ovulation. So the takeaway message here is, yes, maybe you have fewer days that you're at peak fertility as you get older, but Dunson's research provides some encouraging findings for women who are racing against the clock which we'll get into in much more depth in just a few minutes. Now let me introduce my guests. Bruni Getchell is an advanced certified hypnotherapist, licensed mental health counselor, and a Reiki master practitioner who has practiced for over 25 years in outpatient psychiatric facilities, mental health agencies, school settings, and substance abuse treatment centers. Allison Sepinera is a licensed psychotherapist who specializes in holistic and mindfulness work with women and children who struggle with anxiety due to the life transitions that they experience, such as divorce, motherhood, death of a loved one, relationship struggles, chronic illness, or career change. Allison helps other mental health clinicians build their social media presence by helping them create an authentic, ethical, and compelling brand. Bruni and Allison, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. Hi, thank you so much. So excited to be here. It's really a pleasure to have you on. And I want to let listeners know the inspiration for this topic. 
I think Bruni and I, we were talking about some of the issues that we see at different stages of life. And as a developmental psychologist, I'm always interested in how we think and behave differently and how life's journey and the, and the experiences that we have impact us differently based on our stage of development. And so we were going back and forth about the biological clock and how it's not just something that we deal with in our 20s, 30s, and 40s in childbearing years, but it affects us later in life as well. And then Allison and I connected and then Bruni and I pitched to Allison, hey, would you be interested in the biological clock? And Allison said, oh my gosh, yes, I have so many clients who Mm -hmm. this is a key issue for them. And we did a series of posts on Instagram and there was so much response and obviously a lot of people were feeling some of the things that we were feeling ourselves over the years. And so we wanted to bring it to the podcast. So thanks again for your time, ladies. Yes. Thank you for having us. I so, so appreciate this. I mean, I love your podcast, Dr. Oh, Karen. Thank you. It's so, your topics are so pertinent and relevant and relatable. Love, love listening oh, to it. So thank thanks, you. Yeah. I feel very privileged to be here today. Thanks, Bruni. I, you can call me Karen. Okay. <laughs> Karen. All right. Yes, I feel the same way. I, I love your, your podcast and everything is so relatable and just identify with so many different issues. And I, I can't wait to dive in. Great. Well, no, thanks for the feedback. And I know you guys are psych nerds like me. So it's been really fun to kind of take my professor realm, that whole part of my identity and bring it to the broader audience and take some of the psych research that I think it's fascinating, and I'm always convinced if people are presented research in the right way, they'll also find it fascinating. So the biological clock, as I mentioned earlier, it seems like something that would be during a certain stage of a woman's life. If she wanted children and she wasn't married or was experiencing infertility, that sort of thing, that's where we kind of normally think of the biological clock at work. But Bruni, you have mentioned that actually you see it even with the demographic of women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, I, I think we're all timekeepers to some degree. We're looking at the, our life timeline and, you know, our running lists and narratives of what am I going to do before this time? Well, I got to get this done. You know, how can I get this done? I got to do this before time runs out. Yeah, I agree. It's something that I think many of us, and of course the research we know even more so recently, all this mindfulness research is showing us that much of our anxiety, which Allison can speak to that. I know that's one of your areas of expertise, but Much of our anxiety is because we're living in the future and much of our depression is because we're hearkening back to the past all the time and we're not in the moment that is. And when we stay in the moment that is, it helps us kind of take away some of that pressure you're talking about, about this checklist and this time clock that's always ticking. Allison, what do you see with some of your clients? You mentioned before that this is a really key concern. Yeah. So I'm so glad you brought up the mindfulness piece because so much of the way that, um, you know, we think has to, that, that causes our anxiety or worry is a lot of thoughts related to either the past or the future. So something that, you know, happened that we keep thinking about and maybe we wish we didn't do or, you know, why did that happen? And then the thoughts that we have, all of our what if thoughts that create um, so much anxiety. What if this happens? What if this doesn't happen? Things that we don't even know yet about the future. So it's so important to remain present. And there's so many cool strategies and tools that you can use that I use with my clients um, that I also have on my website um, as far as breathing strategies and grounding strategies that can just really help you feel um, more in the present moment. And so a lot of the clients that I work with are women that are in life transitions, whether it's motherhood, whether it's divorce, whether it's empty nesting, or they're getting older and they're seeing their parents die and they're experiencing loss. Um, There's just, there's so many different transitions that can just cause you to, to be just really anxious. And so with the biological clock, a lot of the clients that I see are, are thinking about their loneliness um, mm. because I work with a lot of um, 20s and 30s and 40s women who feel as though they they are like time is running out to have a child and they want children or they want a companionship and it's not happening yet and they're wondering why and so really helping giving them the tools and strategies to remain in the present moment. And then along with other ways of finding companionship that might not just mean romantically is, is something um, I dive into as well. 
And you spoke to that so nicely in the post, in the series that we did, because I think one of the things that people forget if they focus so much on that desire for the one, and I get it, you know, I wrote my whole book about how to, like you're saying, how to remain happy, hopeful, positive in the midst of life, not playing out per your plan. And and so the idea that we can find love and connection and that intimacy, intimacy can be very powerful from our friendship groups. And so that's something that we can, it's not the same. We're not trying to say that that's going to take away that desire for a romantic connection, but it is a wonderful way to take that energy and put it, direct it towards something we can control because the finding the one is not 100% in our control. 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Bruni, I'm sure you're seeing some women who, you know, going back to some of the women that Allison's talking about who maybe are thinking, I'm 35 and I was supposed to be married with two kids by now. But Bruni, I'm sure you're seeing uh, in your demographic, you're seeing women who had it all at 35, but then it didn't work out. So sometimes someone may feel like they're on track with their plan until mid 40s, early 50s. Then the marriage breaks down, then the life isn't playing out as they had expected. Absolutely. Absolutely. As you were talking, I was thinking about a client I had last year, a woman in her early 50s with three kids who actually reminded me of myself. Um, it's funny how our clients sometimes mirror <laughs> what's happened in our lives. Right. <laughs> and uh, they resonate with us in very personal ways. But I had a client last year who came in. She was a woman in her early 50s with uh, three kids and was really unhappy in her marriage, had um, gone to counseling, couldn't convince her husband to participate in marital counseling, but she went on her own and just continually kept coming back to the same to the same point, which is I'm just so unhappy. And what I found with her, which was my my experience as well, there was so much judgment because of her age. And so she thought she was going to get some support from family and friends. And um, she said when she went to her mother and said, you know, I'm going to get a divorce, um, her mother quickly shouted at her and said, are you kidding me? You're no spring chicken. What are you, <laughs> oh my what are God. you, do- what are you doing? How are you going to find a man now? How are you going to support yourself? How are you going to do this? And so I had to, I I remember that appointment very clearly. I was just shaking my head thinking, oh my God, this was my mother too. (laughs) She said said the same thing. But, you know, so I think part of this whole pressure, this biological clock pressure um, comes externally, comes from People who in your lives um, who are uh, looking at societal norms and and trying to impose and infuse their expectations and their values of what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, how you're supposed to do it. But we kept coming back to, you know, what's in your heart. And so we talked about how, you know, when you stay in a loveless marriage for a long period of time, you eventually become very resentful Mm -hmm. of each other. And then in time, I think that seeps into contempt. And it just, there's a breakdown. There's a real breakdown. I wrote an article a couple years ago um, called Meringle. I think I sent it to you, Karen. It was my my little play on words with with uh, partners who stay married, who are not who are not connected, who are not emotionally connected. So they're married, but they're single. Yes, yes, and, I remember. Uh, you did. Yep. So, so I call them moringles, and these are these are um, couples who stay married for reasons other than love. You know, my client was in that in that space, and and she even said to me, "I don't know, can I start over at fifty? Is it possible that I could that I could find love at this age?" So the biological clock definitely affects us all in so many stages and ages of our lives. And and I just want to jump in for a second because I I, I see um, you know even some of my older women clients be in the same types of situations where they're in this this marriage and I'm thinking of one in particular where she has been married since I would say she has known him since she was 14, 15. And she's been married. She's been with no one else. And she's been living a life. And she has two children living a life exactly the way you describe. No fulfillment. Really, really just not in love. And and it sometimes is just so hard 
to, and I, I'm just saying as far as myself, I'm not married and I do feel alone and lonely sometimes, but I can't imagine that there's nothing harder than being in a marriage where you're so alone. It is so heartbreaking. And it's one of the reasons I wrote my book because I do feel, and you guys are both speaking to it, I do feel that we see, especially women, because we are still in this new millennium, we are still primarily valued by our relationship status. We are. Absolutely. Men yeah, can absolutely. men can be single for forever, and there's no pejorative term for them, right? They're just a swinging single bachelor. bachelor but a right. woman, after right. a certain, right? He just yep. can't be nailed down because, you know, he's got to party <laughs> down all the time, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but a woman <laughs> is a spinster or an old maid. No one wanted her. I mean, there's a lot of that societal notions that we buy into, whether we want to or not. We don't want to. We try to resist them, but we have to be very intentional about telling ourselves, is this about what I really want or is this some expectation that I'm trying to step into? Which, like I mentioned, that's one of the reasons I wrote my book because I am so fearful of someone, as Allison was mentioning, someone who's been in a relationship with someone from such a tender age. It's very difficult. And we know developmentally speaking that our brains aren't even fully formed till our late 20s. And so to right. make a major life decision and essentially grow up with someone and then at 30 go, I don't think I had a clue as to who I was when I partnered up with this person. Mm-hmm. And it's clear now in my early adulthood that we are not a match, but here we are married with kids. So I'm always trying to catch people before they make that life decision and make sure that they're making the decision for the right reason, not because it's someone's timetable that they need to satisfy. Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. I'd love to connect with you on social media. On Instagram, I'm at Dr. Karen, D-R dot K-A-R-I-N. Here I share my thoughts on love and life through original quotes and images. I'd love to have you join the conversation. On Twitter, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson. You can find me live tweeting my favorite shows, This Is Us, Will and Grace, and My Guilty Pleasure. All shows Bachelor Nation. On Facebook, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. There you can read my blog, see where I'm speaking, and find links to others' podcasts when I'm a guest on their show. There's one thing that I believe, I will just say, that is so important to do that I think will nurture any relationship that you have, whether it's romantically or with your family or with friendships. And I think the most important thing you can do is to focus on the relationship you have with yourself first. Absolutely. And yeah, so absolutely. I write so much about self-love. And I'm actually, for um, anyone that doesn't know, I'm doing a self-love challenge on my Instagram for the month of February. So February is so much about Valentine's Day, right? And right, ooh, right. a couples and let's do this one day. And rem- But you know what? I'm going to focus February on loving myself and being and having my own Valentine's Day for me. <laughs> I love it. That's yeah. powerful. I love it. Important. I love it. Absolutely. And I always wonder, and I, I hear from women, but what if it never happens, Karen? You keep saying to be happy, hopeful, and positive, and work on myself and be the best version of me so that when I meet the right one, we come together very strong and independent, which of course, two strong, emotionally healthy, independent people make the strongest, most emotionally healthy marriages. We know that, right? So I'm always right. encouraging people, but sometimes they... They think, well, what if it never happens? And I I don't have a crystal ball. And I do believe down deep that if you want to be with someone, that someone is out there for you. But I I can't guarantee it. There are no guarantees. So one of the things I like to do is comes from the cognitive therapeutic realm where we look at what does it mean? And so unpacking the meaning, because oftentimes our thoughts, they're loaded with meaning that we haven't unpacked. We just look at the surface thought, but we don't dig a little deeper to say, but what does that mean? So someone goes, I mean, I remember this woman I knew back in my 20s and she'd say, well, I just want to be a young mom. And I thought, even then, (laughs) I thought, so that's someone whose energy is not about meeting the love of her life Mm -hmm. or having a strong, beautiful, very fulfilling marriage that's mutually satisfying for both partners. It's about, I need babies. I need to crank them out. And I have to do this before I'm 25. I don't know what the meaning was for her, but something somewhere along the line told her or she, she ascribed to an idea that a young mom is good. And an old mom is bad, although the research shows that the older parents are better parents because right. we, we're more mature and yeah. so forth. And that, that is from the psych literature. But so when we look at something like that clock ticking, 
And whether it's the milestone birthday, right? 40 hit and I'm not where I want to be a 45, 50, so forth. If we look at what that clock is ticking, what is it about? And figure out that's what was behind it. Because if we look at the meaning, then we can choose to continue to play into that meaning and give it energy or go, actually, I can think of this as meaning something entirely different. Well, I think um, something you said earlier, I'm I'm big on looking at uh, core beliefs. I think those are so tied into mindsets, you know, whether or not you have a fixed mindset or, or growth mindset. And I think that often when clients are stuck, you know, I, I spend time with them going through the, the list of their of their beliefs that have been developed very early in life. Yes. And um, what I try to do with clients is, is have them take a look at, okay, what is it that um, that you're so afraid of? Or what is it that you, you know, you maybe could let go of um, so that you're living a more authentic life so that you're more invested in, in your personal growth? And um, what are you doing, you know, that represents those values? What are you doing in life that's keeping you in a place where you can live fully every day, regardless of the circumstances around you. Karen, you and I talked a little bit um, online about um, Glasser and Bill Glasser, how he talks about the quality world. And I think that all of us growing up have these pictures and ideas and, our, and images in our, in our head about what life is supposed to look like. Right. At a certain age, you're supposed to do this. At a certain age, you're supposed to do this. At a certain age, you're supposed to do that. And I think sometimes people get stuck um, when those images and those pictures somehow don't come through, they, they're so disappointed that, well, it didn't work out. It didn't quite work out. Okay, maybe not that particular image, not that particular story, but we all have the, the ability to start over, to turn the page and reframe. And I know, Karen, you've talked about that a lot on your podcast, to be able to reframe as gracefully as I can and then start a whole new story. Well, no, the value is then what is the underpinning for the meaning, right? Which is then the underpinning for the thought and which is the underpinning for the emotion. So it's all there stacked up on top. Right. Exactly. And I want to just, because you mentioned a reframe, which is such a powerful tool, but for someone who's not really familiar with what we're talking about here, let me give an example just to concretize it. So a reframe, for example, I had to use when I called off my wedding at 34, because initially Mm -hmm. the meaning I gave to that was I'm a failure. I'm 34 years old and I stayed in a relationship with a man who I wasn't crazy about from the beginning, but I did it because of all the expectations we've been talking about this entire episode. But he was a good guy on paper and a a good guy in real life too. I just meant on paper, he looked like the perfect fit. And so I tried to convince myself that it was my problem that I couldn't be excited and enthusiastic about this relationship. So I've tried to force it for four years. And so when I called it off, Initially, I saw that as a failure and I'm a psychologist and I should have known myself better (laughs) than to stay in a relationship that I wasn't passionate about. And I felt like a bad person. I felt like I disappointed my family. I disappointed his family. I broke his heart. I felt horrible. Now, the reframe I finally had to come to, which was powerful and finally helped me move through my grief, I had to reframe it that the most loving, kind thing I ever did for this man who I did love, by the way. I wasn't in love with him, but I loved him and cared about him. The most kind, loving thing I ever did for him was to call off that wedding Mm -hmm. so that he was freed up to meet the love of his life, who was not me. Once I reframed that in that way, I was able to move on. And it's true, by the way. A reframe isn't just putting a a little sunny spin on something. It is true. No, it's true. Allison, I'm wondering if you've been able to use reframes with some of your clients in terms of the issues we're talking about. 100%. So something that is so common in in the women that I see, because I do see a lot of single women that are in their late 30s, 40s, that also don't have children. And there is this really big, intense fear of being alone forever. Absolutely. Very much this intense fear. And that's a lot where their anxiety comes from. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about the thoughts that we have, so I do a lot of cognitive behavioral work. Um, we, we focus a lot on the thoughts that are behind those core beliefs. Mm-hmm. And what are the intense thoughts that are so loud in your mind all the time that are kind of keeping mm-hmm. you paralyzed in this lifestyle? And so it is huge, the mindset shift and the, and the rewiring or the reframing that we can do. And, 
And, um, you know, it's so powerful when you actually recognize that it works, you know, yeah, and, and absolutely. you know, you need support. I, I, I see my own therapist for this. It's amazing when you actually, and empowering when you feel like it's starting to work because, um, the reframe art, they are true. It's just starting to believe that that they are. And so that intense fear of being alone, you know, someone might have a, a lot of racing thoughts about, you know, dying alone. You know, they're in their 30s. Sure. And they're scared of, you know, dying without a husband or with children. Like, who's going to take care of them later in life? Like, if they get older, do they have, you know, they don't have a brother and sister, you know, where do they fit in? It's so huge, too, because when I, I talk so much about finding community in your 30s and 40s and even older, um, outside of your, you know, even if you're married outside of your family, finding community where you feel people understand you, even if they're not in the same exact um, lifestyle as you, you know, Mm -hmm. what kind of community is out there for me? It's yoga. I have a yoga studio that I'm obsessed with in Conshohocken in my town that I live in. And, um, you know, it's such a huge part of my life and they're my community and for a lot of different things. And I've met so many amazing people. Um, some of my clients are very spiritual. Some of them are religious, but not religious. Some are spiritual and they go to, um, you know, they go to a church or they go to a synagogue, some, some other type of community that helps them. So just having, having a community, I can't stress enough is so powerful, but also recognizing again, if you feel like, you have tried this and you've tried it and tried to reframe or you've tried to find community, you feel so lost, I would highly suggest going to a professional counselor and really talking through some of this with them because it's been so powerful for me and for my clients tell me that that they are so um, thankful for the support. So um, being able to really just process those thoughts with somebody and learn how to do the work. And I would echo, Allison, to look for a therapist who has a cognitive orientation. Yes. And, yeah. and if, if that's not clear, I mean, because we've talked about it a little bit, it, it's, we're all talking about the thoughts, basically, because I know that not everyone is <laughs> running around knowing the different therapeutic orientations that are out there. So, and if you're, if that's not clear, we're going to give our contact information at the end of the program and please reach out to any of us and we'll help you understand. We can even look at like a bio, someone's mm-hmm. description of, of their therapeutic orientation and their modalities. And we can let you know if that's a good fit because honestly, Honestly, I think for what we're talking about here, and we're all speaking from our own personal experience as well, that those cognitive strategies, which I learned like you ladies, I learned when I was in school to become a therapist, but then I think I did some powerful work on myself over the years Absolutely. with these tools that were meant yeah. to help others that have definitely helped myself. And, and also, Allison, I appreciate you reminding listeners that getting the therapy is so powerful and that we as therapists... We're in therapy whenever yeah. we need it. I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of like a mental Absolutely. health checkup. The Absolutely. way we would go to the dentist or the doctor, we go to our, our own therapist. So please understand that when we suggest therapy to you, we're saying that from a place of we've done it ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Um as far as yeah, getting extra support um from a clinician is so powerful in the sense that there's always room for um, self-improvement and self-awareness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Part of the reason, as you both know, is that there's so much judgment um, around getting therapy and, and getting extra support, which is so unfortunate. You know, that, that people say, oh, I'm not going to go see a doctor. I'm not going to go see a therapist. I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll just talk to you. I'll just talk to you. And it's like, ah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh. That's called a dual role. They don't realize yeah. that. So sometimes people go, well, you're a psychologist. Yes. And I, yes. And I tell them, I'm like, but I can't be your therapist. I'm your exactly. friend. It's a different relationship. But they, I know. <laughs> I don't blame when them. I- <laughs> Everyone knows I love nothing more than a party, which is why I'm so excited to welcome our newest sponsor, Chaotic and Collected Garlands and Party Decor by Jess Downey. Jess creates hip and handmade party supplies. Check them out at Chaotic Collected Inc. Dot com. And if your party has a theme that is a little unconventional, Jess is your girl because she loves creating custom designs for your party. Say a hipster baby shower or a craft beer party or my annual wine and cheese soiree. Chaotic and Collected Inc. Dot com. 
Well, and we've been talking about the expectations that others have and how we, if I let others' expectations or society's expectations of where I'm supposed to be and who I'm supposed to be, if I let that affect me, then I'm giving power to entities. Why would I want to give them power over me? I don't need to, I don't need to let anyone else's perception impact me. It's a choice. And that's where to me the power is. I can go, you know what? Your path is great for you. And I respect your choices, but I prefer to keep my path and, and the meaning that I ascribe to my journey. I, I prefer to keep that power in my own hands. And, and I don't know if that's helpful for clients ever, but I know for me over the years, I've been thinking, gosh, I'm giving away my power. <laughs> I don't know I why know. I'm doing that. <laughs> I know. I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you're in control of a lot of your life. You are. And, yeah, absolutely. you know, with the women that I work with that are single, a lot of times, you know, they're looking at external things that are happening and blaming those things for them being alone or, yes. you know, all of the experiences they're having, whether it's from online dating or anything, you know, there's always something that's happening that is not giving them the results, you know, and, and then we talk about kind of solutions for that. Right. When you're single at my age, um, you know, you do have to kind of navigate through comments like, uh, oh, she's still single. Why are you still single? And aren't you afraid to be alone? Aren't you, you know, aren't you afraid to be alone in your apartment, in your condo? Um, why aren't you out there? Uh, and then you hear the, oh, like a spinster, an old maid. <laughs> it's just Right. It's, it's, it could be tough out there, a jungle out there with judgment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, and Bruni, weren't you telling me one time we were going back and forth that some of the people in maybe their seventies and eighties will be combing through the obituaries to see if someone's wife has passed away so they can pounce at his door with a pie. And (laughs) I did did say that to Karen. I was 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 tired of, I was tired of online dating. And so someone said, "Hey, you know, if you just look at the obituaries, I'm sure if you just show up at so-and-so funeral home, that's local to you, you can just show up and take a look at the the guy, you know, the, the widower and just say, Hey, I'm available to talk. I'm here. <laughs> Give them my card. <laughs> she said it might be quicker right. than online dating. Right. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Right. Yeah, you could uh, be really slick and, and hand them a, a card and say, I'm a grief counselor. Yes, Let me I help could. You out with that. I, You're I, I really could. Yes. Just dive into the dual role exactly. entirely. <laughs> Do you need someone to talk to? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I remember when I was struggling, when I first called off my wedding, and one of my besties was reminding me when I'd have these moments of, gosh, should I have just gone through with it? Because as you know, when you make a major life decision like that, it's never clean. I mean, there were moments where I doubted, did I do the right thing? I Mm. followed my gut, but gosh, what if what if my gut's going to cause me to be alone forever? Like Allison's talking about with some of her clients. That's not a fun thing to think about. And I had cats, by the way. Three. Oh, cats. (laughs) The cat lady. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The cat lady. Oh. Right. But right. one of the things that I, that so my, my bestie would tell me, she'd say, Karen, you could have married him, sure. But the life that you want, the marriage that you want, you would not have had anyway. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you could have had the marriage, check. And you could have had the kids, check. And had the life that appeared so fine on paper. But she's like, you would have been miserable inside because you're hoping and believing for something that's more powerful and more intimate and more real. And you would have signed up for this phony version of it. And I have a, a quote I put on Insta. You know, the option to settle really isn't an option. Right. Because I was going to settle and think that that would take care of it, right? Well, I've just made my choice. I'm going to just go ahead with this. But it wouldn't have been an option because I wouldn't have had the marriage that I wanted and that I believed was possible. And as we've been saying, I think that would have been a far lonelier place to be. I think no one's more alone than in a lonely, disjointed, disconnected marriage. Absolutely. And I think when you settle, you know, that's just the beginning of the layering of feelings because when you settle, I think in time, you get to that place that I talked about earlier, the resentment because you're unhappy and then eventually, you know, the breakdown. Uh, Yeah. I I actually talk about settling in in the article or the post that you posted as well and pressure from society and even maybe on their own, like who who you you were talking about before of the, the woman that just was like, I just want a child. I want a child by 25. That's what I want. 
And believe me, I actually know women that they just, that's what they wanted. And guess what? I would never at all want their relationship. And I hope that, you know, as parents, they're good parents and those children grow up and, you know, in a loving household, but their marriages are really not, you know, the most stable that I would say, um, as far as someone that maybe was looking for a partner because they're looking for a partner and they want this companionship and not just because, you know, they have this, this urge to have a child so bad. And that's a lot to place on a child, by the way. Absolutely. You know, we're not supposed to have kids to meet our needs. We're supposed to have children and meet their needs. What I'm hearing there is a woman who, for whatever reason, wasn't going to feel fulfilled and complete as a woman unless she was a mother. And I get that. You know, we have biological, we, we're designed to procreate. I get it. I feel that yeah. as much as any woman. But at the same time, I don't think it's fair to settle and crank out a couple kids. And let's be honest, we have kids that are getting diagnosed with psychiatric illnesses when if we look at the family, and how the family's functioning, we can see a marriage that's completely disjointed and broken down. And the kids are responding as a kid would to that dynamic within the family. And then we're hopping the kids up on medication. I mean, there are some real, real ripple effects that happen when we settle. And it's not kind and loving to your future children. No, no. Just to wrap things up, yes, we have to acknowledge that there's a clock ticking. Of course there is. But make sure that the the part of the clock that is ticking the loudest. Let's make sure that the clock is about us exactly, and about our values, as you spoke to, Bruni, exactly. and not about the expectations of others that we are perhaps giving way too much power to, as we talked about. Are there any parting thoughts or takeaway messages you'd like to leave with listeners? And then, of course, I want listeners to know where to find you and to take advantage of Allison's uh, February deal. <laughs> So I, I guess I'll jump in and, and just say yeah. thank you so much again for having me. And um, if there's one thing that uh, I think at any age, any woman and man can do is really try to really try to um, open yourself up to being vulnerable to your own feelings and your own thoughts and really um, incorporating more love into, you know, loving yourself. I don't know if you guys are fans of Brene Brown, but yeah, the, yeah, gifts absolutely. Of, yeah, absolutely. the Gifts of Imperfection is one of my favorite books. And it's just loving and embracing all that you are. And if you can absolutely. just do that, then you, your relationships should be a breeze. Yeah. <laughs> should be. <laughs> I don't know if they will, but you know, if you love yourself, maybe you'll get through a more it's, challenging time. It's a solid first step. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything you said, Allison, was absolutely right on, right on. Mm-hmm. But what I will add to that is that our lives are a big deal and we need to invest in ourselves. Like, like you said, like we said earlier, it's important to, to make self care a priority in your life. And when you take care of yourself, it's um, you're investing in your personal growth because you don't want to be stagnant. You want to shift and you want to grow at, with every stage and every age in your life. Even at my age, I'm still learning new things. I'm trying to maintain this growth mindset. I just started doing the Insta <laughs> stories. I'm so excited. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I am. I am. And, and I write in my blog about the bucket list. And it's just so funny, the pressure for people in my age group have with this bucket list that I even uh, said to Karen that I feel like there's bucket list shaming because if you, you know, it's like the Holy Grail, it's a Hollywoodized. And if you're not doing these real exotic, exciting things at my age, then, you know, oh my God, you're going to run out of time. <laughs> All like, right. You know right. what? You got to take care of you. Thanks again, ladies. And where can listeners find you if they want to connect with you further? Uh, so this is Allison and, um, you can find me. So my website's allisonseponara.com and my Instagram is at the anxiety healer. Um, and if anyone wants to take part in my self love challenge for February, just find me on the anxiety healer on Instagram and you'll see it in my stories where I'll, I'll let you know what you can do. And then I'm also on Facebook, uh, Allison Sepanara. Great. Thanks. Bruni. I'm Bruni Getchell. You can find me on Facebook, Bruni Getchell, or my website, uh, brunigetchell.com. I'm on Instagram, Wellness Therapy, with some new Insta stories that I'm just learning how to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 
All right. Well, great. Thanks again for your time, ladies. And I appreciate the collaboration we've done. And I hope to do some more in the future. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much. Had so much fun. I loved it. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karen. You bet. So the love and life hack for this week is the clock is ticking. Of course it is. But we're in charge of what that ticking means, how we interpret it. We can look at it as a thump, thump, thump that's forcing us into making decisions that aren't for us. Or we can just listen to it and notice it and let it be and not let it control us. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. This is Dr. Karen Anderson Abral. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, make it a great week. Dr. Karen Love and Life is produced by Tim May and host and executive producer, Dr. Karen Anderson April.